Chapter 6 homework on momentum and collisions is currently been moved to Wednesday the 2nd so that we can conclude looking at an example of an elastic collision today and then I'll describe how that should be applied to the elastic question on your homework. Uh, before we get to that, we will open up the floor to any homework related questions that you guys do have because my hope is that you've been working on a bit over the weekend. Um, Additionally, I want to at least introduce what we'll be talking about for the next couple of weeks. Um, that will be rotation. So, uh, chapter seven and eight for the next couple of weeks are both sort of one combined large chapter on the math of rotation. There's a surprising, uh, there's a surprising amount of that. And before the end of class, I do want to at least introduce some of those concepts because lab this week will be about rotation. That's kind of your first introduction into that field. Um, additionally, uh, we're kind of coming up on the next test. So I kind of want to discuss that briefly with you guys now so you have the information sooner. Today is again the 31st and for the next two weeks, we're going to be working on rotation chapters, seven and eight combined. It's really one long chapter, so there's just gonna be one kind of combined homework for it. And my hope is for us to have the second test, which would be chapters five through eight, everything covered from, we took the, from the time we took the first test, in the week before Thanksgiving. We would take it during lab times between the 14th to the 17th. I want this to be what we end up doing because one, it gets the test out of the way before break, and that's one less thing to worry about while you're gone. Uh, two, it means that when we get back from break, we can focus on talking about one or two small additional concepts, because sound and waves are good to know about, and then start reviewing for the final, which this would be the week of Thanksgiving, 21st through 25th. We just won't meet that week because there's not gonna be any lab, half the week is chopped off. Uh, we wouldn't meet Wednesday or Friday anyway, and so I'm probably just gonna cancel class that Monday anyway because I have too many things going on all over the country. I'll remind you of that as we get closer to the day. Uh, that means when we get back, 28th through December 2nd, will be additional concepts and review week 
before exam season begins the week after. How's that feel? Yes. Do you know what day our exam is? I should. I keep I usually keep a tab open with the academic calendar, but I keep closing it for some insipid reason. All right, exams begin December 8th and run through the 13th. So this Thursday is the start, this Tuesday is the end. The actual exam time slots are here. Of the four days scheduled for exams, I have this class, this lecture meets for C, E, and F periods. So this class's exam will be given once Monday, December 12th at 8.30 a.m. and twice December 13th, uh, once at 8.30 a.m. and once at 1.30 p.m. Kind of like with how the labs are interchangeable, the exam slots are interchangeable. I'm giving the same exam all three times. I don't really care which one you show up to have a preference between these three times. Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do keep in mind if everyone shows up for F just to get in as much studying as possible, then this room will be very full of people. Any other? Okay. Calendar stuff. Are you guys feeling any more questions? All right. Uh, homework stuff. Again, the chapter six homework is due Wednesday, so it's not due tonight. But what sorts of questions or issues do you have about it at this particular time? Chapter seven, chapter seven, what? Number seven on the homework involves an elastic collision. So after we work an elastic sample today, I'll compare it to this one to set you up for it before you head out of here. And additionally, I want to look briefly at number four, because it's, the concepts involved aren't difficult, but it does ask them in kind of a weird way. So I just wanted to look at it briefly together. Four is a two-part question. Of those two parts, only A matters, because B is a question where it asks you to upload a file, and again, it can't grade what you upload, so you could upload a JPEG of the B movie and get a free point. Uh, so B doesn't really matter. What matters here is A, the concept involved in A. And the setup that it presents to you is an interesting conservation of momentum situation. This is called a ballistic pendulum, this current model here, the block of wood hanging from two ropes, highly advanced tool. And it works exactly as you think it would. You hit it with something and it starts swinging. And you can measure how high it rises to gauge how much energy and momentum it had as a result of the crash. They use these in um, ballistic tests a lot because if the object swings upward, that's better than it flying off of your shelf. And in this particular case, it is someone is testing, firing some object into the wood, so there will be a collision. The bullet is going to have momentum before it strikes the wood. The wood will gain momentum in that collision. And what motion do you think this object will undergo once it has momentum and kinetic energy?
since it's a pendulum and therefore connected via a vertical rope, it can't swing straight backwards, so instead it's going to come up in kind of a circular arc motion. And what you're actually asked here is the question wants you to calculate a ratio. And without having any numbers, it wants the ratio comparing the total system momentum after the collision to the total system momentum before the collision. So this would be comparing the momentum the bullet has by itself versus the momentum the wood and bullet combined have after the crash and after they've begun moving. Now you weren't given any numbers for this, but with the concepts we've discussed already, what do you know about the relationship between momentum final and momentum initial in a collision like this? the same number. Total momentum initial is total momentum final. And therefore, what this ratio is having you do is divide a number by itself. So you don't even need to know the momentum. As long as you know they're the same, the ratio is 1. 100% 1 of momentum is conserved. That's all it's asking. Cool? Uncool? Questions? All right. Uh, if any other questions come up or pop into your heads, please let me know. You can cut me off in sentence any time. For now, let's continue on and look at an elastic collision example together. We've we started this question on Friday. We've got these two vehicles both automated and roboticized so that there's no humans involved for safety's sake. And we are going to crash them head on into each other to see what happens. That's, that's how all the fun science happens. We did the inelastic version. And in the inelastic version, we assumed the two vehicles would stick together, share the same final velocity, and we found that final velocity to be negative 30 meters per second. They both have this final velocity, and that being the final speed was very hurtful for the sports car, because it was originally moving 45 meters per second forwards, and is now moving 30 meters per second backwards. That's a change in magnitude of 75 meters per second. Sports car loses this fight. And now we're going to examine the elastic version, and it's going to lose even more. As a reminder, car crashes are designed to be inelastic, because in an inelastic collision, only momentum is conserved and kinetic energy is not. The objects also tend to stick together and share the same final velocity. This last bullet point is not always true. There's, for example, a homework question where two vehicles come up, collide inelastically and they don't stick together. But that question does give you one of the final velocities, so there's only one unknown to find. This is contrasted to elastic collisions in which both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. This means there's literally more energy involved in the proceedings, and things tend to rocket away from each other at relatively higher speeds. Again, compare throwing a basketball at this wall to throwing a ball of clay at this wall. Because they bounce away from each other at high speed, The objects won't have the same final velocity, and that's what makes the math for this subtly more difficult. Since the two vehicles have to have two different unknowns, since we can't guarantee them the same number, we have to find them separately, that leaves us with two unknowns in our conservation of momentum equation. Whereas when we did it inelastically, it was the same unknown since they stuck together, and we could just solve the one equation to find the one unknown. 
They don't have that luxury this time. Here, there's two unknowns, V final car and V final truck, in the same one equation. The initial side is still the same, but now the final side is, on its own, unsolvable. So we need something else. We need to employ a trick. And what do you do when you have one equation with two unknowns in it? find a second equation with the same two unknowns in it. An answer that some of you might be internally rolling your eyes at, which is valid. Our two unknowns here are VF car and VF truck, and we need some other equation that contains the same two unknowns, some other thing we can examine that compares how these things are moving before they crash to how they're moving after they crash. Momentum by itself only got us this far. We need to now examine something else that involves the same two velocities. And conveniently, the definition of velocity has provided us, sorry, the definition of an elastic collision provides us with an answer. Momentum is conserved in an elastic collision, and furthermore, kinetic energy is also conserved in an elastic collision, the same way momentum is. Again, this is only true for elastic collisions, so if a question says inelastic, don't do this. But if it is elastic, we can examine the KE initial and the KE final the same way we've been doing for momentum. These two objects will bring some amount of energy into the crash. They must both have Ke before they collide because they are both moving. After the crash, they will still have some amount of Ke because they will both still be moving. In an inelastic collision, this energy level tends to drop because energy gets wasted, sent into friction, turned into heat, goes all sorts of places. But in a perfectly elastic collision, it stays in the kinetic form because it was stored as EPE and then released again. This allows us to use total kinetic energy initial equals total kinetic energy final to compare the sum of the two vehicles' initial kinetic energies to the sum of the two vehicles' initial, uh, two vehicles final kinetic energies. Note, when you plug in the KE formula, it would involve Mass of the car, velocity initial of the car, velocity truck, velocity initial of the truck, and the final velocities of both objects. All the same unknowns, well, all the same variables, known or unknown, just in a slightly different configuration. And that's what we need. Same equation, same variables, including the same two unknowns. So this extra equation would allow us, that second equation, to be able to solve it for one of those two unknowns and then plug that into the first one, cancel one of the unknowns and find the other, like how we would used to do with the two equations, two unknowns trick. Any conceptual questions about how this works up to now? Yes? Um, why are the really negative four sides with this truck? Like, are they not coming each other? They are approaching one another, which means that their velocities point in opposite directions. Wait, was that what you asked? Mm -hmm. Since they're technically in opposite directions, one of them needs to be negative. Why did you choose the truck? I chose the truck. It doesn't technically matter which one you decide is negative, as long as you're consistent. So you could draw this in reverse and say the truck is positive, the car is negative, and as long as you are consistent with that through all of your work, it'll be fine. So, 
we could perform two equations, two unknowns, to combine the kinetic energy formula with the momentum one. And that would work. That will absolutely work. What I don't like about this method is that the kinetic energy formula has a squared in it. All the velocities are squared, which just makes life harder. Because if you solve for one of those velocities, then you'll have a square root of something that also has a squared in it. It's just kind of a pain. So thankfully, some very smart people noticed that we have these two different starting points for elastic collisions and sort of combined them into a third one. We've already described momentum is conserved in an elastic collision, kinetic energy is conserved in an elastic collision. So these are both valid starting points for analyzing the motion involved in an elastic collision. But because KE is kind of a headache, since so many terms in that formula are squared, someone developed this third option. This is a third starting point, a third equation that contains the same two unknowns. So we technically have three equations with the same two unknowns in them. That's, and I, that's not to be intimidating, the fact there's an extra equation. It just means that you can pick two of the two out of the three. You have to combine two of them and you can take your pick of the three. This third formula here specifically is designed to compare the initial and final velocities directly of two objects involved in a one-dimensional elastic collision. It specifically only works one-dimensionally and if only two objects are involved. And then, frankly, that's all the types of collisions we've been studying. We haven't dealt with three-dimensional or two-dimensional collisions yet. It's just been forwards or backwards in a single axis. And we've only ever looked at two objects at once. Here we've got the truck and the car. For an earlier example, we had an arrow and a log. So this equation works to compare the velocities of 1D elastic two object collisions. So just going down the list, one option is comparing momentum, one object option is comparing kinetic energy, one op option is directly comparing initial and final velocities of the two objects. And if this formula works, if this formula, if the question you're looking at fits this description and this formula works for it, this is the simplest one of the three to use because it's just the four velocity variables and nothing else. No squares, doesn't even have mass in it. So, for our current conundrum, where we need two equations with two unknowns in it, we have three equation options to pick from that have those two unknowns. Momentum, kinetic energy, and additionally, that third equation, which to my knowledge doesn't have a name. Let's just call it velocities, comparing velocities directly. Momentum, kinetic energy, and just velocity. Three equations, two unknowns. That means we can pick any two of the three we want to combine. This means you have more options. More options is a good thing. Based on whatever question you're working on, you can proceed however you want to. In this particular case, since we need to do two equations, two unknowns, my preference would be combining the two equations that are simplest. And in my opinion, that would be momentum and the third velocity equation. Because they have the fewest things in them and there's no squares. Any questions before I proceed with such an with such a with such algebra? All right. Now, 
I've taken this third equation and plugged in the two things we already knew, those being each vehicle's initial velocities. Note, this formula is written in a particular order, and you have to order things in it in the correct way or it doesn't work. Formula says velocity one initial minus velocity two initial equals velocity two final minus velocity one final. They have to go in that order, and they have to be minus signs between them. Our initials here are 45 forwards and also 45 backwards. So that would be 45 minus negative 45. That ends up being positive 90. Any disagreement with that? So positive 90. I'm also going to move the negative V1F over to the left side to get rid of that negative. Oh, well, I should write one to push it back. Correct. Final. And car final. This tells us 90 plus VF car is VF truck. And this means wherever you see VF truck in any of your other equations, you can replace it with 90 plus VF car. And that's exactly what I plan to do. I'm going to take that and plug it into our previously worked on momentum equation to help solve for that final VF car. Now, the momentum one's the same as we left it last time. Last time we discussed how the two different velocities make things harder. The masses are still the same, and the initial side is still the same. So the initial half is unchanged. We've still got momentum car plus momentum truck, adding up to negative 72,000, the same as last time. So we're just starting from the same place. The right side, we now have the two different final velocities, and in place of VF truck, I'm now going to write 90 plus VF car. This eliminates VF truck as a variable, VF car is the only one left, and now we can solve for it. There is an amount of algebra to get to first, and questions before we tackle that. We're going to need to distribute 2,000 into 90 plus VF car. First is 2,000 times 90. This gives us 180,000. There's a lot of energy and momentum involved in making cars go fast. Then 2,000 times VF car is just going to be 2,000 VF car. leaves us with two terms with VF car in them and two terms that don't have a VF car in them. So we need to consolidate all of the non-VF car terms over on the left and combine all the VF car terms together on the right. Subtract 180,000 from the right over to the left. That would be negative 75 minus 180,000. This uh, becomes a grand total of negative 252,000, a lot of momentum. That just leaves our two VF car terms on the right, 400 VF car plus 2,000 <coughs> VF car should be 2,400 VF car. Last step should then be dividing both sides by 2,400. <clears throat> and that will give us what value for VF car?
Say again. In what direction? Left. Very good. Does anyone disagree with negative 105 meters per second? I don't. That is very fast. That is about one third the speed of sound. So, brief, brief comparison. Sports car, truck. Car loses. Car loses big time. Car's gonna get thrown into on it. Car's gonna get launched into something. You know that much. <laughs> Now let's compare that to the inelastic final velocity we found. Inelastically, when the car is stuck together, <coughs> excuse me, uh, their final velocity was negative 30. So originally the car's delta V was 70. 40 forwards went to 30 backwards. Here we're going from 45 forwards to 105 backwards. That's a delta V of 150. Twice as big of a delta V, twice as much impulse, twice as much force involved in this crash to launch it away at that speed. If this car was a pancake before, it's been reduced to a cannonball and launched accordingly. Again, elastic collisions are dangerous. Hence why bumpers are not made of rubber and springs. Uh, once you have this VF car, you can take it, plug it into any of your other equations to confirm what VF truck should be. So 90 minus 105 VF truck is negative 15 meters per second, which may not sound like much, but keep in mind, it was originally moving at negative 45, so its delta V is 30 here. Whereas before, it went from negative 45 to negative 30, which was a delta V of 15. So it also had twice as much impulse, therefore twice as much force. The truck still wins, but it still takes more damage in this version. And the drive, if it had a driver, it, the, they'd suffer more whiplash. Questions thus far? All right. So we have found all of the final velocities, both for inelastic and also. Elastic. I'm just going to record those up here real quick. Oops. Inelastically, they're both at negative 30. Elastically, they're at negative 105 and negative 50, respectively. What I'm gonna do quickly with you guys now is utilize the kinetic energy equation briefly that we kind of looked over a minute ago in favor of this one, because I want to show you what happened to the energy in this crash. I want to one, prove this one works, and two, verify that energy is in fact lost in the inelastic version. Prior to finding the two final velocities, this equation represents the comparison of kinetic energy initial to kinetic energy final. Now that we have both the elastic and inelastic final velocities, I'm going to work this twice, once with the elastic ones, once with the inelastic ones, to verify if kinetic energy is conserved and in which one it is. The entire left side here, Kinetic energy of the car, one half times 400 times 45 squared. 
plus initial kinetic energy in the truck, one half times 2,000 times negative 45 squared. Note that since you're squaring it, the negative goes away. This gives us, regardless of collision type, an initial kinetic energy of about two and a half million joules. It takes a lot of energy to make large, heavy vehicles go fast. People wonder why there's a fuel crisis. Now, again, I'm going to do the right-hand side twice. First, if you take the two elastic velocities and plug them into this equation and solve for what that right side would come out to, it solves for the same thing. If you plug in negative 105 for VF car and negative 15 for VF truck, you'll get the same amount of energy. This shows that in the elastic version, it was perfectly elastic, all the energy was conserved. If you instead plug in the inelastic velocities, uh, negative 30 for the two final speeds, The initial side is unchanged, but what happens is the final side comes out to only 210,000. That is a energy loss of more than 90%. Where'd it go? It wasn't destroyed, it had to go somewhere. Not a trick. What's the first place you think of when energy ends up not being conserved in a situation? Friction. Correct. In inelastic collisions, there's more friction involved. Friction's going to take energy away and turn it into heat where you can't see it anymore. So that's one place that we that 90% energy loss went. Another place is actually sound as well. Because crashes like this, they're dumping a lot of energy into their surroundings. Any energy that ends up in the air itself makes the air start shaking, and sound is literally just shaking air. That's all it is. So an amount of it becomes noise, and that tends to be why inelastic collisions are louder than elastic ones. Drop a basketball from the top of a building. You'll hear it, but it's not dramatic drop an anvil from the top of the building, everyone knows about it. Uh, the last place that that energy goes is actually just into doing the work of taking the bumpers of each car and crumpling them. This is why cars have a feature called a crumple zone. It's the entire front or rear section of the car that's designed to crush in a collision to take the damage so that the people inside don't. So if you've heard the word crumple zone before, it is referring to all parts of the car designed to crunch so that the humans don't crunch. Um, when you take any object and physically destroy it, force it inwards to compress it into a smaller size, you're doing work because you're exerting force and your hands are moving some distance. So you're using up energy to deform the object. And in the case of plastic and metal bumpers, they're designed to deform and stay that way. Whereas a rubber object would go back to normal and release that energy again. So the fact that your bumpers bend and stay bent is a feature, not a bug. Because you want them to crush so that all the energy doesn't end up in you and your neck. Paint to have to swap them out and get them fixed after a, after a fender bender, but the alternative is making them out of rubber. They don't get damaged, but then you get thrown into oncoming traffic with whiplash before anything else happens. So, when's the new
Questions? All right. To compare this back to the homework real quick, seven involves an elastic collision. We've got these two blocks sliding down a half pipe and they're going to have an elastic collision in the middle. First thing you gotta do is figure out the speed at which they're going to collide. Since they're descending from some height, they will have GPE turn into KE. Use that transformation to figure out their final velocities. Well, final velocity before they crash. Once you have part A done, make sure you have correct answers for this one first. You're gonna take those answers and use them to figure out what the final velocity is after they have an inelastic collision would be. Sorry, I said it wrong. After they have an elastic collision and bounce off of each other. This, in terms of the formulas and algebra involved, will look a lot like what we just did because you've got two objects approaching each other, you know their masses, you would know their oncoming velocities, and you've been tasked with finding their final velocities. So setup would look identical, save for swapping out the numbers you plug in for F and B. Once you do part B and get those correct final velocities, the object will bounce away from each other and eventually try to rise up the two sides of the half pipe again which means that their KE would turn back into GPE. It would be a different amount of KE because they have a different velocity now, but however much they have will turn into GPE and they'll rise to certain heights depending on that value. So that's how you do seven. Cool, uncool, needs, concerns, I could. As a reminder, this is due Wednesday. You don't have to do it by midnight tonight. You can work on it today. You can come to tutoring tomorrow, and we will also revisit it on Wednesday before it's due. Uh, as a reminder, we're gonna be studying rotation this week. Uh, lab this week will be on rotation. If you have it before we meet for next lecture. Uh, as such, I want to, you can pack up. We're winding down here. I just want to show you something first. Again, just introducing concepts, that's all. Chapter 7 and 8 combined will be approximately a two week period spent studying rotation. Rotation's kind of funky for reasons that we will discuss on Wednesday. For right now, before your lab this week, there's a couple of vocab words I want you to remember from your past science classes. And they're the concepts of centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. I'm hoping these words sound familiar to you. The phenomenon they are referring to, this car is not flying or falling, it's going to be just driving along the ground, this weird bird's eye view. Uh, if you're in a car and the car is moving forwards and starts to turn left, <clears throat> when turning, your direction changes, correct? You were moving forwards, your inertia, your momentum would normally have you keep moving forwards at the same speed. Under normal circumstances, the universe would keep moving you forwards something from outside of the car has to exert a force on the car to make it begin turning. We know this because if its direction changes, since velocity is a vector, a change in direction is a change in velocity. A change in velocity is by definition an acceleration, and all accelerations are caused by forces. Therefore, there is a force making this happen. And realistically, if you're the one driving, you turn the wheel, you turn, that changes the angle of the tires. 
that changes the direction the force is acting on the car point. And specifically, when turning, there's a force pulling you towards the center of this kind of circular arc. So this force is making the car turn, and that force is called centripetal force. And it's gonna be what we study in lab and in lecture later this week. We will also be separating it from the idea of centrifugal force. If you haven't heard centripetal force, you've probably heard this word instead. And it's always some, I always have to go through a, a, a brief tangent rant to differentiate between the two. Um, to keep it short, centrifugal force isn't real. And yet it's the word everyone keeps using to describe this phenomenon. So we'll talk more about that in lab this week. For right now, keep this, this picture and these vocab words in your head. And we'll discuss them in lab and lecture this week. Cool? All right. Questions, needs, concerns, etc. for right now? All right. In that case, um, I'll see you for either lecture Wednesday or lab today. And I like have happy Halloween dudes. <laughs>